Good news, everyone. They fixed the patch, or I should say Jeff fixed. Well, it's kind of based on some other stuff. Anyway, I'm getting ahead of myself. Threadripper, Linux, BFIO, IOMMU pass-through. It's fixed. It's working. The link and a mini how-to for Fedora is in the description of this video. That's all you need to know. Everything else is just gravy. Shortest video ever. That's it. It's over right now. No. We'll go into a little bit more detail. Check it out. This is our test system. It is a Threadripper 1950X. It is in a Luxurian Fractal uh, Define R6. Yeah, I think, I think that's right. This thing is glorious, this machine. Um, it's a Threadripper 1950X, and you know, knocked to a cooling right now, I'm running a Radeon Pro WX7100, along with a GTX 1080. So the GTX 1080 is passed through to a Windows Virtual Machine. I'm gonna kinda move this back here. This is our Windows Virtual Machine, and then this is our Linux machine. It's running Looking Glass. So, nested page tables, fixed. Performance issues, fixed. Uh, turbo boosting CPU. You can't see it, but my little GNOME status indicators in the top, I'm bouncing between 3 and 4 gigahertz on my status indicators. Everything is working correctly. Threadripper is a beastly machine. The early adopter tax is basically gone as long as you're willing to run kernel 4.15 or newer. This also works if you have an older graphics card like the uh, Fury X, but you'll need a kernel parameter to enable um, the the next AMD display driver stuff that's in kernel 4.15. Now, if you're going to use Vega as your host GPU or your guest GPU, you're not you won't have to do that. Setting up VFIO, all the same rules still apply for that. It works it works really really well. If you're running you know Ryzen or something like that. You don't need it. Uh, you don't need the, the PCI bus reset patch. It, it, there's not really a multitude of bridges on PCI bridges, like Jeff, Jeff Bridges. I don't know. I don't know why I, always, I don't know why my brain always does that. But you don't really need it on Ryzen because there's not really any uh, any PCI bus reset issues or anything like that. We we can actually take a look at the website real quick and see here. Um, we've got this. This is our Threadripper fixes. This is our mini how to. You see, this is where I am. I'm working on this. Oh, gosh. So here is the link to the thread on the forum, Fedora 27. This is the particular setup. I've also tried a couple other graphics cards. This is how you customize your kernel and apply the patch. Now, if you are using Ryzen, um, you don't need to apply the Threadripper patch because the nested page tables patch is already there. So if you're running a motherboard with an X370 chipset, you're already going to be able to do this. I get a lot of questions about the B350 chipset. There are a couple motherboards, like the ASRock AB350, where you can get a PCI Express by 4 connection for your second graphics cards. But in general, I really recommend the X370 motherboards for PCI Express pass-through, because you get by 8 by 8 uh, configuration on your GPU. And on the B350s, at best, you're only ever going to get PCI Express 3.0 by 4 for one of your graphics cards. And I just, I, I, you, you really need a by 8 by 8 connection going forward stability and and you just you don't want to fiddle with the, the 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 rough edges that come with the b350 if you know what you're doing you can get it to work on some but not all b350 motherboards so with this patch there is no reason not to use threadripper for pretty much anything that you would want to use the 16 the, the, the performance of this thing is absolutely beastly as configured right now i've got an intel 900p optane for my primary ssd and i'm running windows from a Samsung NVMe one terabyte uh, NVMe. And the NVMe is passed through in hardware, just, just like it were a device. And there's no performance penalty associated with that because nested page tables uh, works properly. And we'll run through some benchmarks and we'll do some stuff live with the chat here at the end because this is a, a live stream video. So, you know, look over it. There's no editing. There's some rough edges. There's some, there's some, there's some fun stuff in here, some Q&A at the end. But yeah, this is this everything works works really 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 well. So MSI supported this project, as has Sapphire Technology um, and and other companies that have provided support for this project. So a huge huge thank you, Eric at MSI um, has been very patient with me, and I've sent him all kinds of info, and he sent info back. We set up a test system together so that we could reproduce some of the PCI bus reset issues. I know that he's working with some of their they're engineers and, and things like that. Jeff um, sort of packaged the uh, packaged the the issue and, and put a kernel uh, patch on on patchwork. And so, oh, you can oh, why is that? 
What does that work? It should work. There it goes. Here's the patch on Patchwork, and so it explains the bus reset. Now, Alex Williamson is also a god among men, and he really knows what he's talking about. And because this is not an issue on Xeon, you know, he's wondering about if somebody from AMD will weigh in here as to, as to what's going on. So, long story short, there are multiple PCI Express bridge devices on Threadripper. And the specification says when you reset the bus, you need to save and restore the register. And so is the specification talking to a hardware implementer like AMD, or is it talking to somebody on the kernel side of things? And so Alex, who's a you know long time, he's, he's, he's the hardware guy. I mean, he's, he's the guy. Like, I don't even know any other way, other way to explain it. He's, he's 007 for, you know, he, him and Alan Cox and those guys go like, wait, he, he's the guy. Like, he is a god among men. And um, the, uh, he's not wrong. I mean, he's looking at it. He's like, well, we don't have to do this on Xeon. And so maybe Intel interprets the spec as when we do a PCI bus reset in hardware, we will save and restore the configuration registers for the bridge device. On, on the PCI Express bus. But if you do it in software, it works. And you don't have the invalid header 7F. You don't have any of the problems with the PCI bus reset situation. Um, and so there was a, the, the attempt before this, there was kind of a, an ugly patch before this where it would just copy all of the PCI Express configuration space reset and then restore it. That has its own set of problems. This is much more surgical in that it's only saving and restoring the configuration space for the bus that is being reset. One read of the implementation could be that that is perfectly in line. And so whoever implemented this originally is going to have to look at it and, you know, like, did you implement this according to spec? Or what did you think this meant when you implemented this in hardware? And so whenever, whoever did that will speak up and say, oh, this is what I did or this is not how it should be. We can either formally work around it with a quirk or say, yes, this is how it is on Threader for devices. But long story short, stability testing, we've been doing the stability testing, we've been doing the integration testing with graphics cards. We've tested Fury, uh, well, yeah, yeah, Fury, not the X. We've tested an R9 390X, Vega, 1080, 1060, 1070, 1070 Ti, although 1070 Ti has an asterisk with it because it's newer hardware, so we won't talk about that yet. Haven't tested any nine series cards, because I don't have any nine series cards. Uh, we've also tested it with NVMe. So um, there was a problem that I would run into sometimes with NVMe and Intel 10 gig Ethernet adapters where the Intel 10 gig Ethernet adapters would crap out after they overheat. Normally on Windows, PCI bus reset would fix it. The 10 gig Ethernet adapters on a virtual machine would just go out and then you get the 7F and the machine would hang and be weird. And those problems are all are now also gone as well. And so I'm not, I had not tested kernel 4.15 I'm not sure if it's related to the PCI bus reset from Jeff or if some whatever that was with the network card is just fixed. It was a transient condition. I don't know. I'm also using a different motherboard in this test system because it's got to test all the test systems. But yeah. So again, big thanks to Jeff. Jeff's Patreon. There's a link in the description if you want to support Jeff directly. Uh, Sapphire Technology supplied some hardware for this. AMD has supplied some hardware for this to help us get to the bottom of it. So huge thanks to, to those companies for support. Even bigger thanks to MSI because MSI, well, both MSI and AMD are taking these problems on Linux seriously, which is really, really good for uh, the community. I mean, the community is extremely, extremely, um, shall I say, uh, needy. <laughs> and, you know, AMD's bottom line and MSI's bottom line are not in supporting, you know, the really small uh, tiny companies, um, or like tiny, like these, we, we're the fringe edge case users. I mean, let's face it, let's be honest. We might be the users of the future, but for the users today, we're a relatively small group. And uh, I think that they realize that probably because, you know, we're the IT directors and we're the managers and we're the, the programmers, the next gen programmers who want to be able to run all the platforms simultaneously on one piece of hardware to do their development, to do their work, and to do all this stuff. And so maybe we are like the next generation of people that will come after us, and so maybe they realize it. But huge thanks to MSI. Done a lot of testing with this MSI X399 Gaming Pro AC Carbon motherboard. This is a very nice Threadripper motherboard that is not super expensive. It does not have every 
uh, bell and whistle, but if you just want a motherboard to get out of the way and do its job and has lots of PCI Express and M.2 connectivity, it's definitely worth a look. This is what we have installed. Like Eric at MSI has made lots of experimental UEFIs for me and we've done we've done terrible things and this is the board that we've done it on. So it's, it's worked out really, really well. As you can see behind me, I'm running a Heaven benchmark in Windows. This is also showing off Looking Glass. Uh, if you're not familiar, Looking Glass is a way of copying the frame buffer from the guest machine to the host machine. And so the guest machine is running Heaven, but we are doing a frame buffer to frame buffer copy from the guest GPU to the host GPU. It's extremely fast. There is no latency, very low latency, uh, and it works really well. So if you haven't taken a look at Looking Glass, there's a link in the description. It works really well. It also handles input. So we're using the Spice client for input. So check this out. I've got two sets of keyboards and mice that are that are hooked up to this machine. And so, you know, this is our, our uh, you, you kind of can't see it, but this is our, uh, you can see it when I move the window around. This mouse is our mouse that's just on, um, uh, on the, the Windows OS, or on, on the Linux host. And so if I click into the window, and I do scroll lock to trap the cursor in the guest window, then all of a sudden it becomes part of Windows. And this is the Spice client. So I think um, you guys maybe have used things like Synergy. Synergy is a great program um, to manage this, but this is with the native Spice client. And it works the same with the, the keyboard as well as the mouse. So it's, it's pretty awesome that this is something that uh, is looking glass. How direct is the copy? It's literally a memory to memory copy. Like the frame is rendered on the guest and copied into a shared memory buffer. And then the host GPU is configured to display whatever is in the shared memory buffer in real time. So it's just one memory copy. Everything happens on the system bus. There's really very little CPU overhead. Your GPU is responsible for most of the heavy lifting. So if the GPU is not overloaded, you will have amazing, you know, blinding performance. There's really not, like, uh, except for some edge cases, this is the best performing situation that you can be in with this kind of pass-through basically um, and so this is really exciting to show off and, and sort of a lot of fun for you to be able to package this there are some downsides to looking glass one of them is like the uac prompt you know the elevated desktop prompt because we're using DirectX to capture the desktop it does not capture elevated command prompt so you still need something else like vnc or remote desktop to handle situations like when you're going to install software or something like that that's a little bit unfortunate but uh, you know, otherwise for gaming and for the Adobe suite and for business applications that need 3D acceleration, it is extremely fast. In the hundreds of frames per second, potentially, on this machine with Threadripper, 150 frames per second is no problem. 4K, 60 frames per second is no problem. Again, as long as the GPU is not overloaded because the DirectX capture API depends on the GPU to do a lot of the work there. If you have an NVIDIA Quadro, you can use the NV Inc. Uh, capture directly from your card and that works that works completely fine um, we reached out to NVIDIA to ask them about getting formal support for looking glass to be able to capture from GeForce cards the same way that say Steam does because Steam is eligible to do that we have not heard back so uh, it's it's a little bit of a problem um, it's a little bit of a problem there that that we can't just arbitrarily do that but Got to dot the I's and, and, and cross the T's. This works just as well on uh, AMD cards as NVIDIA cards. Although the, there are, like in developing the software, there were definitely some weird performance weirdnesses. It sometimes in its development history would work slightly better on NVIDIA cards, but part of the problem with the AMD cards seemed to be that the AMD cards would wait an extra frame for compositing, and you can disable that. So it's not, not really like triple buffering, but it would it'd be like VSync plus one extra frame. So like the VSync would happen and the desktop compositor in the AMD rendering pipeline would actually put it a frame behind. So if there are any developers that are working on that and want to reach out for more details on that and, and all that kind of stuff, it's super reproducible. And it's something that we were able to observe with the high-speed camera when we, were, when we were doing all of our testing and integration and that kind of thing. But again, you know, if you've stayed with me this far, the long and short of it is that there is no reason not to use Threadripper for any purpose at this point. 
the performance for virtualization is as good as or better than competing platforms. The stability is as good or better than competing platforms. The feature set that is available at the kernel level from 4.15 for both video, Vega graphics, as well as, uh, as the other stuff is at or better competing platforms with the possible exception of gaming and Vega. We're getting close on that though. We're getting really, really close. Uh, gaming performance is still probably better on Team Green than Team Red for the moment. Uh, but things are looking really good. I did a video a couple of weeks ago, I've been dying to do the follow-up with that, where Vega 64 was faster than a 1080 Ti, even in games like Civ on Linux. And it's almost there, but there's still some compositing issues in the pipeline. So like in Civ, the graphics will flash to be weird and do stuff. But in terms of like Civ 6, Civ 6 was running faster on the, the Vega 64 than on the GTX 1080 Ti um, on an Intel platform. So it's just kind of mind blowing. Um, but again, you know, NVIDIA doesn't really support this with the whole code 43 thing. At least it makes them nervous. So Vega 56, your best value for Linux graphics and going forward is Vega 56. I mean, especially if you can get a Vega 56 for around $400, $450, something like that. Vega 56 far and away is the value proposition. It is really good, especially for Linux. And considering that the driver stack is fully open source, and I mean, look how much code went into 4.15. Like if you go look at the commit history and you go look at how much work AMD has been doing to get everything up to the very high level of standards that are in the Linux kernel, and you look at everything that was approved for kernel 4.15, you know, some of the commentary around the stuff going into kernel 4.15 is like, yeah, this is still not quite up to kernel standards, but this is much better than the stuff that we got six months ago. So going forward, 4.16 has almost as many changes, if not more changes, not just around graphics, but around IOMMU and ACS, a lot of other things. Intel is, uh, AMD is taking this thing very seriously. Intel's got to be losing some sleep about this, especially the whole security aspect of this. So if you would like to support AMD, that is more than enough excuse for you to be able to, to do that, I think. So Threadripper is really, really exciting. I'm really excited that this is... This is so much better. This is so much of a better experience uh, than it was, you know, even two or three months ago. So, <laughs> and this is a live stream, so now we can enter the uh, enter the Q and A part of this video. Did I forget to cover anything? Is there anything else that you would like to know to get started with with BFIO or any any of the other like any of the other stuff that goes into that? <laughs> yeah, I know it's a little bit funny. It's like Vega 56 for $450. I know things have been really wrecked by miners and, and that kind of thing, but just stay tuned. Like, hang in there a little bit longer. PC Master Race, not Mining Master Race. I don't know. <laughs> Get a GTX 1070 bought two years ago when I launched. Yeah, it turns out launch day buying a video card, that was probably a good idea. Because, you know, uh, you can, uh, uh, some retailers like Best Buy, they're still selling the Founders Edition 1070 for $399. But you got to find out, it's like, you know, what days do video cards arrive? And so, like, each location will get, like, one or two, and they'll sell it for three ninety nine or, like, four twenty five something like that. So you should definitely look out at your local local retailer big box store for options. International people are just screwed because everything international is, is almost always mail order, right? So it's a little bit of a problem. <laughs> Have you had a sneak peek of the OpenGL replacement for Vulcan? Things are really exciting there. John Smith, how long until there is a one-click solution for this? The good news is that on Fedora, if you follow the mini how-to, it's not bad. If you're com if you're familiar with using um, the command line for package installation, this is something that you could do in an afternoon. So it's not quite one-click, but it's getting really close. Oh, the other thing I was going to mention is uh, QEMU has gotten some patches that really help things lately too, as well as Pulse Audio. There are some patches around Pulse Audio because some people have problems with audio pass through. Those things have been fixed now as well. We're just waiting for it to make it upstream. And those are things you can deploy yourself if you're in a hurry. But the situation with Pulse Audio and virtualized audio hardware, I've always passed through a USB audio device or passed through a hardware audio device or passed through like the HDMI audio device on uh, a graphics card because of audio issues. Sometimes the audio will, will be out of sync or sometimes those hardware devices don't stay in sync. 
that has all been fixed with the new Pulse audio drivers. Everything works great with those. So it works it works really, really well. I want to have some people to thank for doing stuff. Hang on. Jesus Alvarez, Wendell Gina for cool $5. Thank you. SPWNT says $2. Does this work with Intel? Does it need patches? It does work with Intel, and it does not need patches. Everything is, is built in and works fine there. X99, I'd recommend minimally the X99 8-core for this. You can do it with the 6-core, like the Z370, and it's it's okay. But you need a little bit more horsepower between guests and hosts, a little bit more PCI Express connectivity. X299 8-core would be my minimum recommended. You can do it with the 6-core. If you just want to do it for experimental reasons or you don't plan to run games under Linux or anything like that, 6-core is fine. But otherwise, 8-core. 10 cores, $1,000. Uh, yeah. Works pretty well, though. Super 6-2. Thanks, L1 and Jeff. In OK, $20. Thank you, thank you. Appreciate it. It's all good. And I think I, think I got everybody, so it should be good. <laughs> thank Bill Gates. <laughs> Work with Ryzen. Yes, this works. This all works with Ryzen. With Ryzen, you don't need the Threadripper patch at all. So with, the, uh, uh, with Ryzen 7... You can do almost everything through the GUI with Ryzen 7. There's, uh, you just need to turn on IOMMU by editing uh, a couple of files. Um, and that's the only thing that you have to do that's not point and click. The, the VFIO... Virtual Machine Manager is a GUI that'll let you do all that stuff pretty much continuously. <laughs> mumble, mumble, pulse audio, mumble, mumble. Yeah, I, I know, it's fine. Uh, is Spice stable enough for everyday use with looking glass? It is now, yes. Do you do audio reviews, speakers, etc.? Not really. Not not historically. Will we see this using a seamless Windows integration? So the NVIDIA, the NVIDIA Capture API does actually have an API for capturing individual windows, which would work great for us but we would have to get NVIDIA's blessing to do that. I don't know if AMD's API has something simpler. If AMD's Capture API has a thing to capture individual windows without Chrome, that would be amazing. If there's any developers in the audience that know a thing or two about uh, the AMD Capture API, and it is possible to capture AMD, uh, capture windows uh, using the AMD Capture API, like the NVIDIA Capture API supports on Quadros, then we could, with no work at all, support this. Uh, there's a guy that works for VMware, and I tweeted to him that. It was like, hey, you, you guys should just do this, because this would be a really easy way to chromelessly capture individual windows, and then you could just seamlessly you know, have that experience again. Because VMware are used to on Linux, but they don't anymore. And they were they decided that nobody wants that. And it's like, well, there's several thousand people on the level one forums that would probably disagree with you, but okay, sounds good. Maybe a couple thousand is not enough to support it. So... How long should the setup take for a noob? Um, you could probably do it in a weekend if you follow one of our guides. Depends on how noobish, how much of a noob you are. I mean, it could it could be a, it could be more than a few days, but I feel like that if you, I, I feel like you could probably do it from one of our guides in, in like a weekend. So, do you think we get to a point where we could allow? Three to four people to play a game together. Would that be interesting uh, around desktops? Yes, we did a video on that a long time ago. And um, uh, Linus of Linus Tech Tips has the most famous video on that, which is uh, seven gamers, one PC. They use Unraid. Now, the situation with Unraid is that you can do this with Unraid, but some games like CSGO don't want you to be playing in a virtual machine for cheat protection. So you have to be running on bare metal, whether that's Linux bare metal or Windows bare metal. You have to be running on bare metal in order for the cheap protection stuff to do its job. So with Unraid, you are never running the game in the host operating system. It's always a guest operating system, whether that's Windows or Linux. There's no possible way to play some of those games. But with this, you can. I was able to get Ryzen 1700X and Vega 64 to pass through the Windows. However, Linux and OpenCL 
was not working in an Ubuntu any luck. Uh, it might be working on newer kernels, but you might have to be running a newer kernel. So, how does Windows keep Windows activated under a VM? A Microsoft account is the easiest way, or a retail uh, a retail product key. If you have your Windows tied into a Microsoft account, it'll just automatically know that you've got two different hardware configurations, and it'll just work. If you don't, I mean that's bad because you know you're you're signing you're signing into the cloud every time. But if you have a retail key, it will activate on both hardware configurations and be fine. <laughs> Do you ever Gumtree or Craigslist all the time for buying stuff? Mostly, I don't like I don't like paying retail for things. Does this patch work with Unraid? Not yet. I mean, it, it, there's no reason it shouldn't, but it would be a lot of work to get it get it working. All right. Does anybody else have any other questions before I go, or anybody want to see anything? <laughs> Has your surface broke yet? Mine's all wobbly. Mine was replaced because it was wobbly. This is my second one. <laughs> Rebel Coder, it's 40 rubles. What VM is running? VBox, how is Debian support? This is not VBox. This is uh, KVM on, on Linux. And uh, Debian support is fine. There's a quick start guide. There's a link in the description that has a Debian quick start guide. So you can do all this on Debian, no problem. And you would use the same, you know, uh, VFIO, QEMU. You know, you can do it from the command line, uh, XML edit, whatever. It should be good. It's exciting. Oh, benchmarks. Yeah, yeah. Let's do a couple benchmarks. I think I've got crystal benchmarks on here. Nope, I don't. Well, we can go get it. Oh, maybe I downloaded it. Hopefully this does not want me to log in. All right, what benchmarks do we want to see? Well, you guys, uh, somebody in the chat pulled some reference benchmarks for GTX 1080, Founders Edition, GTX 1080 on, you know, whatever, with heaven. All right, the first thing I want to do is run Crystal Dismark. Yeah. Oh, you guys can't see that. Let me fix that. That's a little bit better in it. Pabus NOK50, thank you for your work. Thank you. It's all good. This is a 1950X. Yeah, so this is about what you would expect uh, from a, a uh, Samsung, uh, you know, Samsung whatever. 950 Pro, 960 Pro, 9... this, but the uh, one terabyte version. This is a five. This is a box with a 512 gig version, but it's the one terabyte version of that. So about three and a half gigs a second. <laughs> yes, this is an X11 session. This is not Wayland.
Crazy, huh? Pretty nuts. We'll just wait for the benchmark to complete. What's the significance of a Threadripper? The Threadripper is 16 cores and like $900 at retail. Turbo's up at 4.2 gigahertz and uh, is insanely fast. I mean, it's, it's pretty crazy. Look at that. Look how fast that is. It's just nuts. Easily port this Windows image to a new VM if needed. Yes. Although this is physical hardware, you can just use DD to copy it. Does this work with Wayland? Uh, not exactly. Well, it works with OpenGL, but uh, not really. 2.1 gigabytes per second. Right. That's right in line. Our virtualized hardware is right in line with where it should be. Okay. I'm just going to stop this because it's kind of boring. Let's do heaven. So... English high, custom DirectX 11, quality high, no tessellation, no stereo 3D, multi-monitor, anti-aliasing off, full screen, system resolution, run. Alright, has anybody in the chat got the uh, specs ready for the normal 1080, like a normal 1080 running at whatever? So this is running 140 FPS, it says GTX 1080. 1191 megahertz, memory 5005, temperature 53 degrees C. I don't think I can punch in any closer with this lens. Nope, I can't. But we'll just have to take my word for it. So, GTX 1080. What 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 sort of specs are we looking at for a GTX 1080? So it's 134 FPS, 140, 150, 148, 144, 100, I guess we could run the real benchmark, huh? Okay, it's benchmarking. How does the guest window handle resizing? Well, it just scales it. So... It just scales it down. <laughs> Man bear pig. <laughs> Thanks. The bench was Fire Strike, and I found the score for 1080 2130. Yeah, it's not Fire Strike. Over 9,000. <laughs> the benchmark on this shouldn't be too much longer. I've seen 6 of 26. I take that back. So we're going we're gonna to zoom out. A little bit more. All right, maybe that's a happy medium. We can kind of sit in the middle here. It's like, okay, we're waiting for it to complete. Do you think this will become useless as most tools and engines support Linux? So this is the Excel, the Microsoft Excel problem. So in the, the year is the, well, the decade is the 1980s. The company is Microsoft. How does Microsoft unseat the incumbent software companies? Because Microsoft was not always insanely huge. Lotus 123 made the premier spreadsheet software. Lotus 123 was everything for businesses and business spreadsheets, and, and, and it was just, it was unbelievably amazing. So, how does Microsoft take over from the incumbent Lotus 123? It took them three or four versions of Excel to figure that out. The, the magic, the answer, was making it so that Excel could save as a Lotus 123 file format. And then it was adopted everywhere immediately. The reason that nobody wanted to use Excel was because they needed to be able to send Excel format, Excel documents to people that could open them. And Lotus was not going to add support for Excel in Lotus, but by adding support for a save format in Excel so that people that owned Excel could still talk to people that had Lotus they could get stuff done. I think that's what's going to happen with this whole virtualization thing. I think that, you know, Mac OS or Windows or whatever, if there's no barrier to prevent somebody from switching operating systems, they will. And so it's like, oh, you know, Linux, is this going to be the year of the Linux desktop? Linux on the desktop is a different operating system than, than Windows. It's not, it's not going to be the same. Nobody's going to pay to build it to be the same. But if this technology works and we're a little bit more polished, 
everybody that's watching right now would have no reason not to switch to Linux because they wouldn't lose anything. They would be able to do everything that they always did as they have always done it with their legacy operating system, but still be able to get to the new awesome good stuff of Linux. And so it's, it is, it's exactly the problem with Excel. I think that, that being able to do this means that you can um, run whatever you want to without being shackled to any, any particular thing. Scene 23 of 26. We still got a ways to go. Default config for the XML or some looking glass. Uh, should be this should be on the forum. Scene 26 of 26. This is at uh, 1080p, I believe. Oh, 1920 by 1200. Okay, so the resolution is 1920 by 1200. Quality, high, preset, custom. We went through the settings earlier. Uh, it is a minimum FPS of 31.2, a maximum of 241.4, score 3652, FPS 145. <laughs> So that's pretty good, right? And it wasn't stuttering or doing any, any weird stuff or anything like that. It worked pretty well. Heaven 4.0 for 1080s, uh, 1378 min FPS, 25 FPS max, 62. So we're actually doing better. This this that's in here is a GTX 1080. You can see there in GTX 1080, 23.2. So some driver updates or something like that, probably helping it be a little bit faster. But the score is literally 30, 3652 FPS, 145, which is about what I'd expect for a Founders Edition 1080. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? The monitor on the left has much better color accuracy. Uh, it just looks that way on camera because this, this is a little brighter than the other monitor. It's the viewing angles. Would it be possible to do, tie this into like Dev Video 1 so whatever shared as a device with Windows systems can use it? Yeah, I mean it's open source. Could could write the thing to do that. <laughs> can you post the the benchmark results? Yes, sure. to the forums. Yeah, I'll add that later. I'm sure you guys don't want to watch me posting stuff. Is there a place to get constant updates on this project? The Level 1 Forums. Forum.level1text.com. Just subscribe to the threads. It should be good. It's exciting. If you're not using your A409U, can I buy it? I want another one. I'm still using it. Just not in here. This is the Linux lab. Can you use the monitor, keyboard, and mouse without 
KVM to PCI pass through? Can you use the monitor? I don't understand the question. You have other benchmarks like 3D Mark, maybe some games like GTA 5 or better, you know, some live stream let's play. A lot of the other the other videos have shown this on the X299 platform and it's it's within, you know, 5%, 6%, something like that. Looking glass is a little bit more of a variable um, because you're copying the frame buffer to the host again. But if you want to, you know, if you use an external display, like if you use the second display as a native display, it's within 5%, give or take. So, eh. What's my current favorite distro? I don't know. That's a, that is a landmine question. I use Fedora and Debian the most. I kind of like Arch. I mean, I did that Arch thing like a year ago, and it's like, oh, this is not bad. I get why people like it. All right, does anybody else have any other questions before I go for this live stream? Maybe I can get an intern who will help me do benchmarking and some other stuff. That would be really good. How are you dealing with the mouse keyboard pass through sound too? So this is uh, a program called Looking Glass and it's using Spice, the Spice protocol, which is pretty standard, like a standard VFIO protocol. And so you just move your cursor into it like any other window. So I've got a Firefox window, which is on, you know, just the GNOME desktop. And then I can move the cursor inside it and, you know, it just, I'm going to save it. And it's like, okay, whatever. I'm going to click close and it's fine. Now, when you're playing a game, when you move your cursor to the edge of the screen, you maybe don't want your cursor to hop out of the edge of the screen. And so you can use scroll lock to lock the cursor inside the screen. Uh, the other thing is mouse acceleration. So Windows has mouse acceleration. So if you move your mouse really fast, it moves it fast. And so the sometimes you can get out of sync between the guest and the host. But if you disable mouse acceleration, it'll stay the same. But scroll lock, honestly, for most people, you just scroll lock and toggle it. And then with scroll lock, your cursor is locked inside the Spice client window. So it works really well. Uh, does it need a composite manager to be running to avoid tearing? Not the application, no. But uh, there's a weird problem with GNOME 3 and the AMD GPU stack in that it seems to take an extra frame, which introduces extra latency. Have you tried Premiere on it? Does it work with remote FX? Yes, it works fine with the, the entire Adobe suite works completely okay with uh, this setup. Uh, it can't not. So, do you suppose Epic will have similar capabilities? Yeah, probably. How would you rank Looking Glass versus using a KVM switch? Um, it's about 98% as good. And better in some ways. How does the looking glass work with 144 hz G-Sync? You need more GPU overhead to deal with that, but it works fine. I mean, it's looking glass is still beta, like late alpha, early beta software. You got to keep that in mind. But uh, I was doing 120 FPS plus in Tomb Raider. It's basically okay. I experience lags with the mouse, like feels delayed when using looking glass. Any idea what that could be? Try passing the mouse through as USB, like get a second mouse and pass it through and see if you still feel the lag because it's either a capture problem or a compositing problem. Uh, you, you might have a problem with your desktop compositor. You could switch from GNOME to something else temporarily and see if that fixes it. It could also be a problem with your host GPU stack, but if you're not using Spice, and you use a real mouse to help diagnose it, that'd probably be really good. Does this work on a B350 motherboard? Uh, you don't want to do that. Oh yeah, Brad Morris points out an interesting thing, because smart guy, always try to save my bacon. The, the upcoming if this is a rumor product, I don't know if this exists or not, but the 32 core 64 thread Threadripper CPU, if it exists, 16 of the cores are not going to have direct access to memory or PCI Express. And so that, that may be a problem. Hey, Sus Alvarez, it's another $10. Thank you for all your work. Thank you. Much appreciated. It's been a few hours. It's time to go now. Can this pass? Pressure from graphics tablets, though. 
the graphics tablet you would pass is no, not through the Spice protocol, but you could pass the tablet through as a USB device and do it that way, and toggle the USB device between host and guest if you want to, if you want to do it that way, and that that would probably work fine. Does Looking Glass lock the mouse in a full screen application? If so, how does it do it? You do that manually with Scroll Lock. Does it pass the most logical CPUs for there? That is technically a kernel thing, and it doesn't always get the get it right. So you can use CPU pinning to increase performance. But I did not do any of that performance tuning on this machine that we did benchmarking on. What do you think about the latest Wine 3.0 RC4? Seems to run the latest game well. Even my GTX 6. Wine is getting really exciting. Do you recommend MSI for the Threader for four builds? So this is the only. MSI Threader for motherboard that I've used, the Pro Carbon, and it has been a solid motherboard. This is also, uh, Eric from MSI has been helping with this Threader for issue, and he has also been super Johnny on the spot to help me through issues and things, and so uh, I, I feel like MSI has done a good job with this, and this board is pretty solid. This, this motherboard does not have as many bells and whistles as some of the other Threader for motherboards, but it is nonetheless a very solid motherboard, and it also is not super expensive, so that works out pretty well. Does Synergy work as a mouse and keyboard capture? Yes, it can. Can Looking Glass pass multiple displays? Think triple 1080p. Yes, it should. Anything that DirectX can capture should work. You just need to display it on triple 1080p as well. So, so it should be good. Everybody, say a big thank you to Jeff for helping out on the development. MSI and Sapphire and AMD and AMD Robert for supplying help and engineering time. It's very valuable for all of this stuff. Uh, it's it's an exciting time. It really is. I'm super impressed by Threadripper's stability. Threadripper's been really really. This has been running for over 24 hours. It's running great. Uh, there's still no signs of you know memory leaks or performance hitches or anything weird going on at all. Uh, you know, what a time to be alive. It's super exciting. Side project, if you're bored, I've been working on a Linux training class. There's links to some of the videos in the description below. If you would like to uh, help me improve the Linux training class before it goes live, um, there's a thread on the forum, maybe. So uh, that might be, that's, a, that's something different. That's why there hasn't been a lot of, of content on the Linux channel. That, and I've been working on this room. So if you, if you haven't followed, this room we remodeled completely in order to have some room to work on this kind of stuff because I need to set up some space where it's set up for a few weeks or a few months at a time and uh, there's no space. So this this room is really, it's a nice lab now. It's a really, really nice lab. We're kind of getting some college students to do some stuff for me too, so we'll see how that that's good. So it could be worse. Thank you again, everybody, and uh, I will see you the next stream. Goodbye. Thank you again.